Welcome. I'm back with uh, now regular guest, uh, Tom van der Lube. He's the lead link of Vizi, a uh, mortgage advisory company in the Netherlands, who have some very uh, interesting work practices. Uh, they use Holacracy. And for those familiar with that, it's a, a business operating system for empowering uh, staff uh, to a degree that is not usual in our, in our businesses today. Um, and today we're not going to talk about Vizi. We go to make an experiment <laughs> we're going to do together a book review this was tom's idea kudos to tom uh, and B tim tom chose the book uh, and it is small is beautiful uh, that's uh, uh whiting out a little bit on the screen there small is beautiful by um by ef uh, schumacher um he's german born but uh, spent a lot of his time in britain um and I thought we'd start, I suppose, Tom, why, why pick this book uh, to be the subject of our first uh, experiment? Um, yeah, there are more, more reasons. Um, one general reason is I think we should read more books uh, and especially also classical stuff um, because then we see, and that's, that's the second point, we see that a lot of topics are much older than we think they are. And we will find a lot of examples in this book. And this book is from the beginning of the 70s. And what I find striking uh, is that in the whole COVID uh, period, uh, where there's a lot of discussion going on about, shall we continue the way we work now? Uh, uh, that if you read a book, which is nearly 50 years old, um, that you find out that the topics are not so new we're discussing now. So that are the, the two uh, reasons, but I also think we should read much more philosophy instead of management books. So it, I think this book has two um, aspects. It has a lot of topics about economy, but there's also a lot about ethics and philosophy, et cetera, et cetera, in it. Right. Yes. And uh, in a sense, you could, I mean, that's the, the central theme, isn't it, really, that um, th this idea that business has improved our living standards, enterprise and uh, industrialization, I suppose, in general, has improved our living standards, but to the detriment of our culture. And of course, when we think about culture, uh, we're talking about um, philosophy, ethics as being the underpinnings for whatever culture we create. And so I think there's some interesting questions here is that is uh, and he talks about it in terms of education and he talks about it generally in terms of business philosophy but are we losing our connection to culture losing our connection to philosophy losing our connection to ethics as we go about building our businesses yeah and the first i think the first part of is of the book the book is uh, has four parts and i think the first part which you which um uh, you also find as a topic again now is that should economy be a kind of neutral abstract science or is it about values? And, and, and you can see, still see in the, in the English language where you talk in a certain uh, university, it's still called political economy, that economy, let's say from, from, from its history, always had values embedded in it as a science. So it's not an abstract kind of physics, no, it's about what's right and wrong. And perhaps that should be the starting point um, because he discusses values and also shows that perhaps the interesting thing is, and that's what I find one of the most interesting part of the book, that he says we are ended up in a very strange situation that economy is, is, is let's say, a, a driving to things which are let's say contrary to the values we have so for instance profit maximization uh, and then and then he takes the buddhist economy as an example um, uh, and perhaps we could dive into that just just to show that on the one hand and that's a discussion which is also actually going on what is what is important for a society and what is not important for a society and how do we do we value this in a society yes 
And then he dives specifically into this moral assertion about the function of work. But I wonder actually then before we dive into that specifics on the ethics of work, does he say something more broadly about society that we want to talk about? Um, yes, I think that in the first part, um, he, for instance, which I find very interesting, for instance, he's quoting Gandhi, uh, and he says, okay, the world is, 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 is big enough to care for all the needs we have, but the world is not big enough to care for our, um, how do you call this, um, um, greed. That's the word he uses, uh, and 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 I mean that's a very philosophical, uh, ethical, ethical starting starting point. And the context of the 70s, the book was written in 30 in 73, was this Club of Rome report. So you also have the this whole idea of um, uh, uh, are we responsible? Are we acting in a responsible way towards uh, our world our globe or our natural resources and that's and that's the starting point of the book which the answer it's a very rhetorical question the answer is no we are behaving in a very egoistic short-term oriented way and we should care about the generations after us yeah 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 and that links that links well then to his uh yeah well, the statement that that he includes, I'm not sh now sure. Yes, uh, yeah, this is this is from him here. He, he, I'll just read the section here. The Buddhist point of view takes the function of work to be at least threefold: to give a man a chance to utilize and develop his faculties, to enable him to overcome his egocentricness by joining with other people in a common task, and to bring forth the goods and service needed for a becoming existence. Um, and that really struck me. Uh, and for many of us, I think we do enjoy work and uh, an occupation that allows us, or at least allows those three things to be true for us. But for many, that is not the case, is it? Um, and he goes on to organize work uh, in such a manner that it becomes meaningless, boring, stultifying, or nerve wracking for the worker would be little short of criminal. Yeah, and that's a very ethical point of view, but it's also if you just go back to the to the roots of economy, it always has been about values. And the point he also explains, and I think, I don't know if the quote is from Oscar Wilde, but um, uh, you have this quote, we know uh, the price of everything, but we don't know the value of anything. So, and the interesting thing is which he, I mean, he has, an, he has studied economics and he says, the absurd thing is that the things we value most don't have a price or, are not counted in our discipline of economy. So if people care for children or care for each other, uh, etc., and there's no price tag on it, it's not counted. So uh, it's not economic growth. Um, and, 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 and let's say pollution is, uh, is there's a value or even we create a lot of plastics, etc. And there you have exactly the other way around. So, and then he even, Ask the question if this way of, uh, let's say, behaving or, or uh, let's say, the way we, we act in this economic discipline, is this even counterproductive in becoming a better world? So that this discipline, which from a starting point had a value starting point, has, has been transformed into the opposite because it, Let's say it, it, there's a price tag on growth, but but it can be very destructive. And on the other hand, if there's no price tag on it, it can be, let's say, from a value point of view, very important for society. Right. Yeah. No, and that's... then and then he ends up saying, just see Buddhist economy. But you also could say, if you take the Greek uh, way of 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 seeing uh, or, or demos, etc., then it's also about value or if you take let's say the christianity it's also about it also values and you also see that for instance we think that there is a kind of right of having a job and then in the buddhist economy as the quote you just mentioned 
I think it's uh, it's expressed in a very beautiful way that we should reflect on that, uh, that there's a kind of right, also from a humanistic point of view, that everybody should have a job. Yes, that's right. And, and uh, this links to another, well, I suppose another way of framing this idea that one of the things that we tend to do or, or can do in I suppose, modern industrial society is to put the human in service of the machine. And, and, some, and we might think that that's a sort of an industrial idea that, that, that when we were serving these, these great machines in heavy industry, but to some extent, we're still doing that, right? But the machines are different than informational machines. And I think he's making this point here is that these tools, this technology should be in service of us, in service of us as a human being, developing our faculties, over, overcoming egocentrism, merging with others to build something greater than ourselves. Um, and this idea of a becoming existence, so a purposeful life, like such important ideas that, you know, are just not considered in... in in most certainly in large corporations um not considered seriously uh and i guess that takes us back to the small is beautiful idea perhaps much harder to do as organizations become larger but it's also uh, a discussion which is going on in society at the moment so if you take for instance discussion about well-being then let's say the starting point would be just forget about anything we have and what would be the desirable outcomes and then, for instance, in this COVID crisis, you see that things which are very important for society, nurses, uh, uh, etc., uh, people working in hospitals, uh, teachers, in this, this whole, let's say, classical discussion we have, uh, we have the absurd situation that things which, are, which we value most or we should value most don't have a price tag or a very low price tag, and the stuff which we don't value a lot or are not very important for our well-being. I would they say take an example, financial industry, day trading, or a lot of transactions going on without any positive outcome for society creates an enormous amount of wealth. And that's, and that's something which he describes to my point of view in a very uh, good way. But this discussion is as old as history. So you can take Buddha, you can take the Greeks, Etc. But at the moment, you have on also on the macroeconomic level in New Zealand the situation that I just forgot her name. Uh, she says, "Okay, now the starting point should be well-being, and from that point we should start to discuss about our budgets." So, and then she says, "Okay, we want to let's say increase life expectancy, or we want to uh, reduce addiction, etc." Uh, so you start from a from um, a value-oriented starting point. And the point he makes is he says, we have a very quantitative quantitative approach and not a very, th this approach should much more focused on qualitative outcomes. Right. Yes. Yes, we, we, absolutely we do, don't we? Uh, we run, we run our economies to a very large extent at the macro level. Uh, on quantitative basis you know we talk about gdp numbers we talk about well even you know we will talk about employment figures we'll uh, everything or the, the the conversation is dominated by numbers i mean even in the covid crisis right it's all numbers but, it's all com it's not it's much less about what do we need to value in our lives in order to be as healthy as we can be um to fight this this disease it's it's everything is reduced the conversation is so frequently reduced to numbers but what i i find even more interesting which is a more um let's say he's he's very strong also from a theoretical point of view so there's a point in the book uh, in the second part uh, activa active side of the the balance sheet so to say and, he, and, and, and then, then he says, in the end, we have turned it around. So the bet, the bet has become the goal, for instance, greed. So prof, profit maximization is in the end greed. 
and it doesn't matter, eh? the whole discussion about multi-stakeholder. Eh? And then in the multi-stakeholder de debate, it shouldn't be all about maximizing profits, but in our way of economic thinking at the moment, it's about maximizing profits. And if you then go back to philosophy, et cetera, or religion, then profit maximization and harming, uh, harming others is, is, is seen as something very negative. So, uh, and then you have the whole discussion about egoism versus altruism. And he says, the positive thing is in our economic model is bad. So our old virtues and love and caring for each other and giving away, uh, stuff away and treating your clients and suppliers much better and giving them enough space. This, this is from our economic way of thinking at the moment. It's a bad thing to do. And, and, and he says it's a, it's a systemic or uh, systematic problem embedded in, in this science of, econo of economics. And that's what I find from an international point of view very interesting. So he says this whole discipline of, e of economics is even a barrier to solving our problems. Yeah. And is somebody who has studied economics and has been a professor for economics and has written stuff for Keynes, etc. So that's what I find very interesting. Yeah. He's, yeah. In a sense, he's, reject, he's rejecting the, the, well, the entire basis on which we think about economies. Yeah. And it's the same what you see in the whole de debate or uh, circular economy, that what I find from an intellectual point of view very interesting, if you have to the, keep it in the ground movement, that they just counted all the reserves of all the oil companies and said, you're not able to, to, to burn all this oil because then the rising climate temperature would be so high that, we're, that, that we have destroyed ourselves. And that's why you have to write down those reserves of which are on your balance sheets, which is taking place at the moment. So, so it's, it's a very abstract intellectual way of thinking where somebody shows that the mental box in which we are is the wrong mental box. So if you are in a growth mental box, you don't understand circular. All right. And he does exactly the same with the economic discipline. And you see this in a more, let's say, soft way, if you take a Matsukato and, and all those people who are writing those books or this, yeah, this books in, in, in this current time. But, but I think he's from an intellectual point of view, much, much more uh, uh, strict and, 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 and shows the contradictions in the way of scientific thinking in, in the discipline of economics itself. Right. But isn't the example you've just given of the, of the, of the oil companies uh, needing to run down the, the assets, I suppose the reserves on their balance sheets or the way that that's valued on their balance sheets, run them down uh, and not add to them. But it, it, even again, isn't that looking at it in a numerical frame? Sure. But right? that's, yeah. As opposed to coming back to, you know, what do we need to value? What do we need to value in this world? Like, what, what, what's our orientation to this world? Where, yeah, what, where, do we, where do we want to direct our action according to an ethical framework? Like, that, that seems to me the starting point, not like what your reserves are and, no, and how does that look on your balance sheet. But that's right. But if you want to, let's say, dive into somebody else's mind, and you have to deal with people who are only thinking in Excel sheets, uh, then I think it's an intelligent move to just count all these reserves together and then, then take this mathematical framework and just then explaining that for every tons of oil reserve, you have an addition on your temperature for, of, of X and then just so showing in their own mental framework that it, that also in their mental framework it's not going to take place because you will you will you will uh, the temperature will will rise uh, on on a level which 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 are not able to survive although the starting point should be uh, from an ethical point of view uh, we should be against pollution or we should be against uh, taking all the stuff out of natural resources for our generation, not leaving something 
for the rest, which he also does in the book, because he, and it's exactly the same discussion we have at the moment, there is an Excel sheet in the book about the percentage of resources or natural resources of of certain metal metals, and and if you and that's also uh, stuff you also see in the books at the moment, but just with different numbers because uh, this Excel sheet in the book of Schumacher is fifty years ago. Yes, yes, but I I suppose I I do differ there because I I think there's a problem if you get into these these calculations is that you're feeding the beast you're feeding that intellectual beast that wants to reduce the world to numbers uh and i i think there's something to be said for stepping away from that um as much as people feel that they want to see the world in that way yeah but just 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 take an example if you would let's say if you have a heating topic so otherwise we we starve to death then 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 and you have oil and gas etc and you just know that that we're nearly to the end as an example and then you say okay but okay then we have used all the stuff what we're going to do next and then you can say okay let's invent nuclear energy or nuclear energy will be back on the agenda and this kind of stuff so i totally agree with you that 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 it makes much more sense to start with a humanistic approach but it's exactly the same topic, and that's and that's mainly your your topic about being human. That I always say, if you are shareholder value driven, and and you don't care about your people, you still should, let's say, read this stuff because also in your framing of shareholder value maximization, it makes sense to be human. Yes, yes. That's uh, and my starting point is not. Uh, I mean, I would prefer people. To start to have all as a starting point that we should care for others, and 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 being human. But if you if if you don't like other people and you just want to squeeze them as much as possible, then I try to to show them that that if they want to maximize their profits, it makes sense from their rational point of view to be more human. Yeah. No, I I, I see what you're saying. Um, sort of meet them at their level uh, and uh, persuade them in terms that, that you know they're already familiar with. Although I think the danger with it is if you, you end up con- perpetuating an intellectual game, um, a rational game, if you like. Um, and I think in the long run, perhaps it's better to to work to connect people more to their hearts, to connect people um, more to to myths and stories, even that. Uh, bring the conversation into the realm of ethics and philosophy uh, that that gives us a chance to i think that's the real opportunity for the reset okay but that's where that's where we differ so um so uh, for instance if it's about layoffs um i i i I don't want to uh, explain a cfo that from a a human point of view he shouldn't uh, lay off people no, then then I prefer to 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 dive into his mental box, or mainly these are men, uh, and then and then and and not not trying to say, okay, when you were the one who was late, of what what would you feel? No, then I would say, okay, if you want to maximize or stabilize your company, and 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 then see this research companies who. Who try to avoid layoffs as long as possible were more successful than companies who laid off their people. And then I I know I have I I think I have a higher chance of of reaching this person because otherwise he just said he doesn't understand. I'm the CFO and and the faster I lay off my people, the higher my chances of surviving or doing better than my competitors. And then we say no, have a, have a look at the research. It's exactly the opposite, but it's perhaps counterintuitive. Right, and that's the mental game I like, which Schumacher plays in an excellent way and plays, to my point of view, much more intelligent than a lot of books which are written uh, at this current moment. Right, um, and tactically, you might be right, especially if you're dealing with a sociopath. Then there's some uh, <laughs> who are overrepresentative, uh, overrepresented amongst executives. Um, in which case, uh, the empathic route is going to have no chance. Um, yes. 
Um, the other thing I thought we'd talk about, and I suppose this does talk to my perspective here uh, in the longer run of um, operating from a, I suppose, a different uh, intellectual f- framework, and that's one based in ethics and, and philosophy. Um, and he talks in chapter six about the greatest resource being education and him lamenting the death of metaphysics, as he describes it. Uh, in our in our education and I and it really had me reflecting on my own education you know firstly in school and then as an engineer and so on and I just you know I just recall just how little just how scant was w- regard for um well for two things really one was for sort of ethics and philosophy in and of itself as a topic to explore as a t- topic to be instructed in and then secondly, to be able to link that across the di- disciplines. So what does, yeah, you know, what does it mean to be, let's say, an ethical engineer? Or what does it mean to be uh, an, an, an ethical uh, actor or dancer or mathematician? Like yeah. joining the dots in a philosophical framework just was not part at all of, of, of my education. And I think he makes a very powerful point. Yeah, in chapter six around that. And he also, but there again, he shows that, um, for instance, I mean, I, I wrote an article, less is more, uh, but also let's say from, um, I mean, there's a lot of research is done um, that, that, that more, for instance, wealth doesn't make you happier. So, so and, and then you even can go further that it's counterproductive. And let's say you also know from families, I mean, that's what we call they are spoiled. So, so, so we still have in our language, in our way of behaving. And if you, eh, if you talk about children, if to, uh, keep, it should be a balance. If we spoil them, they will be unhappy. But then on a systematic level in society, we're doing all the time. We're doing this. Eh? So it's, it's, it, the main thing is that we have too much of everything. So uh, the, all the mental issues, uh, addiction, uh, it, it, it's not that we're starving to death. No, we have too much sugar, we have too much, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, 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 and that's also something he shows, but there's a lot of research done. So people who have won the lottery, they're not happier afterwards, but we think that if we win the lottery, we will be happier. And then I will say, look at the research, and again on the research, it's even, it's even the opposite. So it's better not to win the lottery. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that's 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 the intellectual uh, scientific game I like uh, a lot. But also, for instance, a par- paradox of choice. So the more choices you have, the more the more you you're not sure uh, w- what shall I take, and it causes a lot of stress. Yeah. Yeah. The great example of that is supermarket shopping. So we've got uh, these German discount uh, supermarkets. And occasionally I'll go to the one in Arlo Cotta. <laughs> you know, in and out in like 10 minutes, no stress. There's only two, two types of cheese, to tri- two types of coffee. Like. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, the paradox there is that often they're very good quality because uh, if, you're really gonna, if you're really picking one type of brie, let's say, you're going to make sure it's a good one. Yeah, and that's and that's what he, for instance, understa- uh, describes. And he says, okay, this whole mass production, it's 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 dehumanizing. Uh, but that's on a lot of le- levels. Eh? It's on the one hand, if, for instance, those people who have uh, read Harari. When when I read this book, I thought, okay, Harari has has also read Schumacher, because the whole topic of how do we treat uh, animals, and then he also takes Buddhism again. It's 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 exactly the discussion we have at the moment. Uh, you're referring to Harari, uh, Homo Sapiens, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, for those who haven't read that book, because I haven't read that book, tell us tell us the linkage there. Because no, he says. I mean, there's a lot of. I mean, there's also nothing new, but a lot of people say, okay, the way you treat uh, animals says also something about our own mental uh, situation we are in. And I mean, the Buddhists have the most extreme way. And it's these monks, they are waving the flies away because they are not allowed to, 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 to step on them. Um, 
and Harari has, has also put it in, in, in a more modern uh, context, but he also says, okay, what gives us the right to treat our animals like this? And does it say something about uh, the way we behave as human beings also in our connection to each other? Right. Uh, it's, so it's, it's uh, in German, you would say, verdinglichung. You, you, you make, everything is an object. So an animal is an object, but also human resources is also treating people as objects. You're not treating them as human beings. That's why I, I dislike the word HR, because a resource is is taking the humanity out of out of uh, the word, so to say. And that's something he also describes, uh, and 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 says that in the way we are harming ourselves by, and then also let's say science plays a role or machines plays a role, uh, but but it's it should be a much more fundamental discussion about also about language he talks a lot about language as well yeah and harari yeah. harari harari is uh, is i mean probably somebody a lot of people uh read at the moment um but he, he does exactly the same yeah and that's uh, that's so true um we had a guest on the show jamie cato who was uh um got quite aggressive with me in the podcast uh asking me if i if i still went to supermarkets because supermarkets are complicit in the um, mass genocide of certain species, right? And if you look at it, you know, if you look at industrial farming, in a sense, that's exactly what it is. Um, and uh, we don't, we don't kill our, well, <laughs> we don't intentionally kill our employees. Though, of course, um, we do know that one of the biggest causes of death for human beings is workplace stress. So in a yep. sense, our, our industrial um, culture is killing human beings. Um, and it's certainly having this effect, as you say, of robbing society to some degree of its culture and, and us as individuals of our humanity. I, I think that's you know, absolutely right. And we can look to the way we treat animals as for an indicator of who we are. And another another uh, good example, um, which where you can also see that from an individ individualistic point of view, it may seem that you can optimize your own individual situation, but in the end, it's also counterproductive for your own individual situation. And he takes as an example, for instance, uh, security. And at the moment, with Trump and the US, is a very good example. And you have those movies eh, of people who are closing, not closing the door uh, more. Uh, that 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 that, or also life expectancy. Life expectancy is going down in the U.S. So, or or if the chance of of being killed or robbed, which 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 harms your 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 mental status, uh, 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 then then we should reflect on that and say, okay, a more equal way of wealth distribution will also be better for myself although i'm rich right. and, and 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 that's that's something so if let's say if people are enormously rich but they have to put a fence around their houses and the chance that their children are kidnapped or uh, um, there are a lot of uh, let's say people behind bars or or there are a lot of um, people driving with alcohol because of misery etc then, then the chance is much higher uh, that your life expectancy goes down. And that's exactly what's, what's happening. So also for your own indiv indiv individual situation, it can be, it makes sense to, to uh, let's say, more focused on, on, on a general, uh, um, let's say, well-being of, of, of other people. And, I'm, and then I'm not talking about that, for instance, giving away gives you as a person, uh, a very positive feedback. Now, I'm just also taking it very abstract that, that at a certain point, it makes sense to, to think in a more collective way because it will be positive for your own individual goals. Right. Yes, and in the book, it gives the example of the Scott Barber company who builds up a, a company in the UK and then yeah. he hands it over to, to the company in terms of its ownership, but also has this constitution and as part of the constitution, 
it says it's the ratio six to one, right? No, no individual em employee can earn more than six times that of anybody else um, as a means of ensuring that. Um, but, but I also think there's this, the broader context again, and it comes back to his phrase as death of metaphysics is what you're describing there is a kind of a long run wise view of what happens if we allow inequality to um, rise too steeply or to get to an extent uh, to greater degree um, that can kind of guide us in our moral choices. Um, and it, it doesn't exist in our early training, right? The, the, the sort of the, the, that wisdom isn't passed on. We're not, we're not encouraged to ask ourselves those questions, to think in those times, um, in those terms, should I say, I, I think that I think that's I suppose why he gives it such prominence is this this greatest resource education. I keep coming back to that. Like, and I just look at my own moral training or, or lack of it. I, I can't remember ever having conversations of that nature growing up. But it's the old it's the old education, no? It's the old education of uh, philosophy and uh, humanities, um, which let's say if you have a if you have a strong educational background on that. Uh, and you would become, let's say, uh, a billionaire yourself, you know from a scientific point of view that you should be very careful not spoiling your children because they will end unhappy. So if you know from a, from a scientific point of view that, that, that happiness has a, has a, has a uh, or fulfillment is, is the better word than happiness, but if, if, if that people should have the opportunity to find fulfillment by doing things on their own, then the old idea is that, that you should invest in education. That's why education is so prominent also in this book. And then people have a kind of, let's say, starting point. They have an intellectual starting point. They have a kind of a toolkit. And then they should do it themselves. That's the highest recipe for, uh, uh, let's say, fulfillment. Uh, but that's, that's philosophy. So Aristotle would say, say, live a moderate life. Aristotle wouldn't say, become as rich as possible and, and party all night. Um, uh, no, uh, it's, about, it's about moderation all the time. And we don't live in a time where, let's say, or, or Aristotle is dominant and we tell each other, live a moderate life. No, it's about who has the biggest house and and how many square meters Jeff Bezos just bought? And uh, how big is your ship? And uh, what's your private jet, etc.? From an, from an, from a philosophical point of view, it's it's the best recipe for ending unhappy. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah, and, and look at it in culture right now. I mean, the unhappiness rates are increasing. You've only got to turn on the news to see how culture is degraded um, in recent times. And also, as I as I think about this, we think of education, or certainly I think of it as schooling. Um, but also, again, because of the way as societies we've become much more mobile, we've tended to concentrate capital into cities and opportunity into cities. People move around a lot more. Um, I wasn't. I was barely exposed to my grandparents growing up, and it may be grandparents who would have had that slightly longer term view, who had accumulated more wisdom, might have been more interested in having more philosophical conversations with me let's say I, I had almost no contact with them um so i, I think there's there are many facets to our current culture that um mitigate against having this kind of training in youth yeah, that's why i always uh, like to to talk to people who don't have um agenda anymore so your own parents have agenda they want you to be successful between brackets and, and let's say the older generation is wouldn't be much more, uh, let's say has more reflection. Uh, and I would say now it's about being happy or uh, in balance, et cetera. Perhaps it's changing a little bit because people are much older nowadays when they get children. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm 52 and I have two small children and I think I'm, I'm more relaxed on this topic than if I would have, would have been a father let's say 20 years earlier, and then perhaps this whole idea of succeeding in society and having having great uh, notes in school uh, would be perhaps more prominent because 
I, I have a little bit more life experience and I see that, let's say becoming a CEO of a stock listed company is not something which will make you happy because I know too many who reach that uh, point and they ended being unhappy and telling other people, let's say in a very safe environment, I wouldn't, I wouldn't choose the same route again, but I can't tell openly. And, yeah. and these are the topics you ha- uh, cover in your podcast a lot. Yes. Well, in, in, yes, indeed. Um, I thought the other thing, the other thing I'd, I'd, I'd touch on here, which uh, brings it back to work and, and practicalities a bit uh, in the book. Um, and this is within the, the economics uh Buddhist economics chapter chapter four, page forty, um, and he's talking about the the loom, right? Um, the carpet loom in particular. Um, the power loom is a machine, and its significance as a destroyer of culture lies in the fact that it does the essentially human part of the work. Um, so again, the power loom is a machine and its significance as a destroyer of culture lies in the fact that it does the essentially human part of the work. And so he's linking this machine right the way out to destroying culture because the machine does the human part of the work. And I keep coming back to that idea in the book that we have to put our machines at the service of us. You know, we have to have within our work the ability to express our human qualities uh, with the machines at our service. And so many of our environments don't allow us to do that. And, and thinking back to animals, it's just the same way we treat animals. You know, a big part of the animal welfare movie, movement is about allowing, let's say, a chicken to express its chickenness, right? <laughs> to scratch and peck yeah. and, 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 and make friends and climb and fly around, right? So many of our business cultures don't allow us to express our humanness. And, and apply that human touch to, to whatever it is we're working on. What I find interesting, um, because we also talked about in the past, and that was the last part uh, of the book, is this whole idea of, um, uh, I mean, also the title, eh? Small is Beautiful. Uh, but for instance, that's, that's something which we, with the whole agile movement and, and all those IT companies are, are much more familiar with. Um, is, is, is that uh, small is beautiful, uh, small teams, agility. And then suddenly, suddenly we realize, okay, small is beautiful. Um, uh, and, and, and then if, if it's more about values, we, we, we're not nearly there, so to say. And in the last part of the book, he, he, he talks about self-organization, subsidiarity, um, about too many rules. Uh, uh, and, and also there, uh, 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 values because values uh, uh, are very efficient so if you don't have a lot of values or if you're not very value oriented you have this whole compliance a culture dominated by lawyers who, who, who earn a lot and, and don't contribute anything to society so to say so there in this whole organizational uh, uh, stuff or topic there we are we are because of the whole agility movement, are much closer to to his ideas, I guess, uh, than 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 on on the um, let's say in the other in the other chapters of the book. Yeah, and I think another thread in in the agility movement is craftsmanship, which again yeah. is about me expressing my putting my human touch on whatever the artifact is, be it software or anything else, and. Working in a small teams where I can be recognized as an individual, you know, I can build relationships, I can express my humanity, I can have sort of natural experiences at work. Uh, yeah, this is this is so you know so so important as an idea, uh, and uh, yeah, and the small is beautiful, small as a team, so, but also small in a sense of the of the work. It's like I'm not. I'm not like a small part of like big work. I'm, I've got some autonomy and yeah. some ownership of a small chunk of that work that I can call my own, that I can apply my touch to. Um, and uh, I think we also see it in, the, in, in Etsy, let's say. So I'm trying to wean myself off Amazon. And one of the places I go to is Etsy. Mm-hmm. And that's a sort of successful community of people in small batch productions, yeah. hand-finished products. Yeah. Um, that's a very good this, example. 
yeah, this is this is almost the counter movement. I think this is more um, Schumacherian, <laughs> let's say, in its ethos. Uh, and I hear that more and more, like people trying to coming to this realization that you know, cheap isn't good. <laughs> cheap is, or at least, isn't necessary. Yeah, and also, yeah. and also, there is uh, on the one hand you have globalization, and other people people are um, rediscovering their neighborhoods. So it's also about localizing, uh, which also in the COVID crisis, because people couldn't travel, uh, are, are, I just say, okay, oh, I didn't know that uh, the city I live in or uh, the province or the, the, the country uh, I live in is, is, is as interesting as uh, taking a plane uh, to another destination. And I'm not talking about, let's say, always about that, that, that about climate, et cetera, but um, that's also something that that there's kind of correction, I think, more or less going on. Um, uh, that 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 traveling a lot um, has sometimes positive sides, but also a lot of negative sides uh, on your family life, etc. Um, so I'm 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 very curious when the crisis is over, what what will stay. And where will we go back to the old normal, or are we able to to invent a kind of new normal? And I think that a lot of people who uh, had to commute a, a, a long as a long distances uh, are are really uh, questioning if they want to do this in the future. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm really hopeful, and of course, there are indicators in both directions because a lot of the, the big firms have got a lot bigger we've lost a huge number of small businesses so in some ways this uh give governments have got a lot bigger right <laughs> they've, they've built up much bigger you know uh, debt piles as a result of this which they're going to need to pay off somehow right which probably means bringing more people at higher levels into the sort of tax catchment so on the one hand all of those big entities have got smaller and a lot of the smaller entities have been killed off and as you say there perhaps is looking from a hopeful perspective an opportunity to grow back smaller <laughs> not build back better grow back smaller S grow back more locally yeah and to put some uh, some 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 discussion uh, into it um uh, it also is interesting to see what will happen about this whole role of the state because in the past we said everything should be private and we don't need the state because just it just just leave us leave us alone we as a business community we don't need them now the state is very dominant because let's say because we're in trouble now we say we need the state otherwise we go bankrupt so please subsidize us um, but on the other hand you also see a lot of discussion going on about new forms of ownership uh, so about uh, this old idea of the commons uh, uh, that, that, for instance, this in combination with, let's say, local uh, new forms of identity that people say, okay, now in our village, in our neighborhood, we want to own our electricity or our, I don't know, what, whatsoever, or we, we, we want to keep our bookstore. We don't want to be anything bought on Amazon, etc. So. So what I find very interesting is that this in this, in this, in this last uh, chapter of the book, um, you have a lot of discussion uh, 50 years ago about all these different forms of steward ownership and collective ownership. Yeah. And I, we spoke about this before the show, and I, I, I think the idea of... Well, he, the first point he makes, I think, which is important, is that um, the... By creating more owners of a business, you don't just enhance the quantity of owners, right? You enhance the quality of ownership. Right? That's the important point he makes because as naturally as people be feel like they have a greater stake in this business that they're in, the overall quality of the sort of, I suppose, the stewardship of that organization improves um, it, in aggregate. And I thought that was a... That was an important point. Um, but the company he was, uh, let's say, he founded or he was uh, acting as an advisor still exists. 
So I don't know if you ever have interviewed people of this company. It could be interesting because, yeah. because let's say nowadays the longevity of those companies becomes shorter and shorter all the time. And it also could be a kind of counterintuitive um, uh, aspect again, that by giving away your, it is also this whole idea of swarm intelligence that let's say by, by giving more people a vote, you have a, a, a better quality of your decision-making. It's also kind of this whole idea. We have a very smart leader. I mean, at the moment, we are very lucky that we have Trump. So it shows the risk of if so, to, to give somebody a leader enormous power. But you also have this in, in, in these whole forms of ownership. So I, I'm very curious what will happen. My personal idea is that I think we will come back to collective forms of ownership. So this whole public space will be recaptured uh, by, let's say, the people. Um, uh, but, but, I, but I don't know what, what areas will be um, uh, earlier. So will this be in the, in, 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 in the beginning, let's say, local forms of energy uh, or public transport or uh, saving the bookstore? Or I don't know. Or um, because let's say since the 80s, it had been the other way around. We privatized everything because we thought that would make sense. So where, which government will first start to nationalize stuff again? Because we found out that it was counterproductive for all of us. So is it possible that the labor government in, in, in the UK would nationalize certain public goods again? Yeah, like and really, I, I, or something like that. And I have to say that, in general, the idea of nationalisation terrifies me because that is big. You know, that is big state owning big entities. On the contrary, this idea of a local community taking stewardship of, let's say, their electricity production or let's say their internet provision, something along that line, that like, that along those lines, actually, I think could enhance our yeah. Can, it, can enhance our culture and give us greater connection to our you know, infrastructure and uh, give us a, a willingness to, um, to look after our environment uh, in a different way. But I, I think the idea of, yeah. I wanted to provoke you a little bit. So yeah. for instance, in, in, in Zurich where I live, the, 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 the city electricity, it's owned by the people. So if you want to privatize this, you have to do a plebiscit it's called plebiscite, eh? and yeah, so you, you vote, have to public you, vote. Yeah. You, you have to do a public vote, and then people say no, we're, we're against it. Or there was the the railway is owned by the people. It's 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 not privatized. The the buses and the trams is public ownership. So and then and then and then and then if people say no, we want to skip those lines or those train services because. It's much cheaper, and we could we could earn uh, we could have my pro higher profits than people have to vote on this. And people say, no, we're not willing because that's our public in infrastructure. And I think that we're on a kind of turning point where where for different reasons. If you, for instance, take a circular economy or or uh, let's say also energy, uh, if you want to let's say solve the CO CO two problem. It's, 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 let's say it doesn't fit to an energy uh, company because an, en an energy company who wants to, let's say, act in a normal business way, wants to produce more energy, not less energy, but it's in our public interest to save our world to produce less energy. So I think that this nationalization or this, 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 this re regaining let's say public space, which has been privatized in the past, will in the beginning much more focused on certain topics where we realize together that for a company, it, 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 it doesn't work. So we want to produce less and less energy to solve our CO2 problem. That's something for a business company who is stock listed and want to have higher revenues and higher profits doesn't fit to our common goal right uh, and and none of that works if if you haven't if one hasn't 
adopted a sort of an ethical framework in order to conduct that activity, whether you're in private or in public, right? Because, you know, a public entity, public entity might be um, an equally bad actor, right? If they're not coming at it from a, uh, from, from an ethical perspective, from a philosophical perspective. So, so I do same. think that's the bigger, in some senses, the bigger challenge. But you have the same with education. So what mm -hmm. will happen with education? In, in for instance the US so if 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 college fees become higher and higher all the time and and now you have this combination of of online then at a certain point the question is if we if we want to do something in our country and if education or social mobility is one of the goals of our society is it possible to not uh, use video to educate everybody and say, no, no, we are not, we're not sharing this knowledge. Uh, you should pay a hundred thousand dollars to enter an Ivy League university. And in the past it was, you just could say, okay, there was not a possibility of sharing this knowledge. Like in the middle ages that the books were in the monasteries, but now you have this technical possibility. So why, why do we still think that it's acceptable to ask the hundred thousand dollars fee for Ivy League University if you can just share this knowledge everywhere online. Well, yeah, and I do agree that that's now just become a, a kind of racket, hasn't it? It's almost become like a, a sort of status racket, the whole to a large degree, certainly in the US. Uh, so it's interesting. Yeah, but I have to say that I I was educated in pub, you know, publicly funded schools, state mm -hmm. schools as we would call them in the UK, and. I was, in a sense, trained to be a sort of mindless consumer, right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and an unthinking employee to, in, in the ways that we've described. So, uh, you know, that's why I have little faith that um, public ownership, ownership per se can, would necessarily help. However, the idea of a small community, a group of families in a village coming together um, to socialize the cost of a school, let's say, um, with the intent to educate along you know, ethical, philosophical lines, that, that I'm, co I'm compelled by that idea. In exactly the what, same way that I find Schumacher's ideas, you know, it's small, it's beautiful. Um, sh the shareholders of that enterprise are having an ownership and a stake in it. Uh, yeah. It's, so uh, who should read this book? <laughs> everybody i would say i would say everybody what what i find striking and also uh, a little bit disturbing that that let's say the phase we are in now in this whole COVID crisis which which let's say um, uh, gave us a lot of reflection not only about the way we work or home office etc but also on the on the bigger uh, as, uh problems of society yeah? uh democracy uh, ecological stuff, flying around, uh, saving airliners, etc. And so you have a lot of a lot of discussion going on in the public space. And if you read this, if you read this book, Smalls Beautiful, 50 years ago, these are exactly the same topics. And what I found really disturbing is that we didn't, uh, that we are not much further than we were in the 70s, which I found um, uh, really difficult to deal with or to cope with. So, so let's say if people in the current discussion say, no, no, we are, we are really uh, going forward and we're going fast. I would say we have to look more into history or in, in this case in the seventies, just to remind ourselves that much more energy should be put into this debate for real change, because otherwise in 50 years we were reading let's say the current books of Matsukato and all those others, uh, and, and nothing really has happened uh, uh, again. And also the whole structure of power is much more dominant in the current times than it was in the 70s. Well, yes, yes. I mean, I, that came up in an interview I did um, last week was that we, we know the Pareto principle, right? 80-20 yeah. that... Yeah. 20% of firms in any given market will have 80% of the, the revenue or the, or the market share or whatever it might be. Um, 
he made the point that in the internet context, you know, with the, the this new level of communication technology that's never existed for us before, it's more like 95.5. Yeah, so we've correct. actually bent the Pareto principle with our modern technology. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's uh, it's it's probably worse than a lot of what Schumacher described. Uh, yeah. So, but for those of us who want to fight the good fight, for those of us who want to take a different direction, uh, certainly, I think this would serve as inspiration. Uh, and your broader point of of reading history learning from history uh, in fact the same guy i just mentioned suggests that you should every week you should at least read one book or, or read part of one book that was written before we had the printing press pre-guttenberg which i uh, no, it's interesting i like i like as a it's yeah, yeah, perhaps perhaps you should also mention that um um this book is on the, I think, I don't know on what list, but you said it's one of the uh, hundred. Oh, most influential books Yeah. Uh, of, of last century. Yeah, I, I don't recall exactly which list that but, was. But, I, but I, I mean, at the moment when the book was published, it was a bestseller. Yeah. Uh, he um, he also spoke in the US, was uh, invited by Carter in the White House, etc. So it was an important book in the, in the 70s. And... Um, and it's funny thing is when when I when I put this uh, on LinkedIn, a lot of people who are much older than I am said, "Oh, it's great! You're reading this book again." I read this when I was on the at the university, etc. So, very influential book, um, and 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 I think it really makes sense to read it just to see that the topics we're discussing at the moment were there 50 years ago, and we should really do much more than we than we do at the moment to um yeah to change our societies all right on that note tom thank you very much and yeah thank you for bringing this book to my attention to my attention to making the suggestion of us doing a podcast on it i appreciate that i hope that was useful for people listening go buy the book <laughs> and uh yeah thanks again tom yeah thank you richard I hope you enjoyed this episode of you should read this with me richard atherton and my fantastic co-host Tom van der Luba. If any of the material in this show resonated with you, if you're thinking perhaps how could I take these ideas and apply them in my own leadership or, or take them forward into my own organization, then I would love to have a conversation with you about that. If that feels like that could be a valuable use of your time, then please do click on the Calendly link in the description for this episode. And that will allow you to book a slot directly into my calendar. And I hope to speak to you soon.